Hey, uh, before we get started today, I want to pause uh, for just a moment and uh, pray for Jamie Reagan's sister. Jamie would never mention this, but she has been in the hospital this week, and uh, things are very serious, even as we gather here this morning. And you know how it is, sometimes you come in and you got a job to do, but your mind and your heart are a million miles away, and he's performed uh, wonderfully today, but I wanted us to stop just for a moment and pray for he and his sister. Let's pray. Father, uh, we come before you um, this morning, and, and we know Jamie's mind and heart are heavy with thoughts of his sister Cheryl, and Lord, we pray uh, that you would somehow work in that situation, Father. Uh, we pray that you would bring some good out of what looks like a, a very tough situation. And Lord, we're praying for his family, his extended family. Uh, we're praying for those who are with her today. And we're praying for that your spirit would just uh, do the impossible. In Jesus' name, amen. And please continue to pray for her. Her name is Cheryl. Continue to pray for her uh, in the days to come. Now, uh, if, you were, if you were getting ready to start a movie, if you're going to make a movie, produce a movie, there are several things that all great movies have in common that you would want to make sure you had in place before you started the filming process. For example, you want to make sure you had a complete script that told a story that was worth telling. You'd want to make sure that you'd employed a top-notch cast of actors, people who could capture these characters that you created. You want to make sure you had a top-notch director, somebody who could translate your vision of what you created into a movie that other people would be interested in seeing. But there are some other positions, some other people that you probably wouldn't think about, at least initially, that would need to be a part of your production. One of those people is what's called a film editor. A film editor is the person who takes the raw footage, the dialogue, any sound effects, any special effects, and they compile out all that together into what you see on the screen when you sit down to watch a movie. One of the most famous film editors in the world is a guy named Jeffrey Ford. Uh, here's a picture of him. Over the last 15 years, the movies that he's edited have brought in over $4 billion at the box office, including all the Marvel movies and several other movies uh, that you probably recognize. He was recently interviewed at a film festival, and during that interview, he described his job as a film editor as, quote, shaping the moments that tell the story. And he went on to explain how in his position, it's not just deciding how certain scenes need to look on the screen, it's also deciding which scenes need to be deleted. See, in the filmmaking industry, the editing room is also called the, the cutting room. Because according to Jeffrey Ford, anywhere from 15 to 25% of the material that's, that's originally filmed to be part of a movie eventually gets cut from the finished product. Those are the scenes that you never see. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. Sometimes it's time constraints. Sometimes it's those scenes are too dark or too disturbing or too confusing. Or maybe they just interrupt the overall flow of the story. So when it comes time for the final edit, those are the scenes that get deleted. That's why if you go to the store today and you go where they sell DVDs, you'll sometimes see on the outside of the box, it'll say uh, extended cuts or includes deleted scenes because all those scenes that you didn't see when you went to the theater have been put back in for the DVD edition. Now here's the question. How cool would it be if somehow you could walk in a little studio somewhere Take your seat in front of this huge wall of screens, pull up the raw footage that has been your life, and with just the, the touch of a few buttons, delete certain scenes that have been a part of your story. How much would you pay for that option? Now, for some of us, I think we'd pay as much as we possibly could if there was some way that we could somehow go back and edit out certain parts of our story. Maybe they were too dark, maybe they're too disturbing, or maybe as you look back on them, they certainly interrupted the overall flow of the story. One writer explained the problems with our memories this way. He said, there are two basic problems when it comes to our memories. We remember the things we should forget and we forget the things we should remember. You ever done that? You ever found yourself remembering things that you wish you could forget? Last weekend in our Connect group, we asked people to, to share the name of certain movies that they watched over and over again 
when they were younger. Like, I don't know how it is at your house, but at our house, my son Cannon, he would watch the original version of Space Jam every day if we let him. Now, we don't let him do that, but, but you probably have movies like that. So we went around the circle, and people mentioned movies like The Little Mermaid, The Lion King, It's a Wonderful Life. Then there was one guy about my age who said Cinderella. Um, we then voted him out of the group. So if you need another person... If you need another person for your small group, we've got a free agent that's out there. Uh, I don't know if it's the nostalgia or just the comfort of knowing, you know, what comes next, but there are certain movies that if you're like me, every time they're on, you're going to watch them because they just sort of draw you in. But this morning, instead of thinking about the movies that we enjoy, I want you to think about just for a few moments those, those scenes that have been a part of your life that you wish you could forget. Words that you wish you could take back, wrong turns you've taken, decisions that you would give anything if you could somehow go back and redo or undo. I'm talking about those moments that if somebody gave you the option, you would pay whatever you could if you could somehow go back and and edit them out of your story. If we had to put a label on them, them, we'd call them regrets. The formal definition of regret is sorrow aroused by circumstances beyond one's control or power to repair. Another way to think about it is the is regret is that emotion you feel whenever you think about all those moments in your life that you'd like to go back and redo or undo, uh, all those things that whenever you feel, it's like they just, they just engulf you and bring you down. And particularly this morning, we're talking about the regrets that that we've caused ourselves. Now, I know in a group this size, uh, some of you have had other people who have done things to you and you regret that. You wish you could go back and and undo that. That's not what we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about the things that that we've done to ourselves because the truth is, if you're you're anything like me, you're probably your own worst enemy. And so we're talking about the things that we've done to ourselves and the things that, that maybe we've done to other people that we regret. So if you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to turn to to Luke 19, and and while you're turning there, if you're following along in the bulletin or on the FCC app, uh, there are basically two types of regrets. Here's the first one. The first type of regret is what I call a reminder. So you think back over your life, there are some lessons that you've learned or hopefully learned from some some mistakes that, that you've made that helped you become a smarter wiser, more mature person. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's why phrases like experience is the best teacher or mistakes or the tuition you pay for acquiring wisdom are so popular. If we were to go around the room, all of us could hopefully stand up and talk about something we've learned. You know, here's something we did that we regret that we did that we'll hopefully never do again. And if you had the chance to undo it, you would, but you can't. So you're not going to go back. Other times you'd say, you know, I had an opportunity to do something and I should have taken it and I didn't take it. And if that opportunity ever comes back around, I'm going to jump it. We're talking about those things you learn from the mistakes that you made, either mistakes of things you did or maybe things that you didn't do. So in that sense, regrets are valuable. But there's another type of regret. And rather than being instructive, these are destructive. I call it the, the recurring loop of regret. Now, if you're a person who watches a lot of movies, you know in certain movies, there are certain scenes that once you see them, you never forget them. You may not remember every detail of the movie. You may not remember every plot twist, but you saw certain scenes and you can't get them out of your mind. So if you've seen the 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz, everybody remembers when Dorothy looks over at Toto and says, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. If you saw the Titanic, everybody remembers uh, Leonardo DiCaprio standing up there, you know, I'm the king of the world and all that stuff. If you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you remember when they stormed the beaches of Omaha and you'll be find yourself, you know, days later, months later, long after you've watched the movie, and you remember, you remember those scenes. And you've probably got some memories like that. As you look back over your life, there have been some, some magic moments that you love to relive. You know, the game winner you hit in high school, that big adventure you went on, that, that fish that you caught that just gets bigger every time you tell the story. I mean, it doesn't take much, and you're instantly transported back into those moments, and you can feel it as if you were there right in that moment. But for most of us, there are some other moments that you've lived and I've lived that were not so magical. In the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah looked back over his life, 
And he talked about these moments that when they entered his mind, he couldn't help but feel the sting of regret. Here's the way he says it in Lamentations 3. He said, I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast with me. You ever had a memory that every time you thought about it, it tasted like you were taking a drink of something that was bitter? You ever had a moment, you're out doing something, you know how it works, you're, you're doing something totally unrelated, and this memory enters your mind, and all of a sudden, it's like it just engulfs you, and for the rest of the day, you're wrestling against this feeling that you wish you would give anything if you could forget it. And the problem is that some of us get trapped in those scenes, and no matter how hard we try, we can't seem to find a way out. So every time we lay down to go to sleep, it's like we're right back in that moment. We're reliving every feeling. We're replaying every conversation, and we feel that emotion as if it were the very first time. And, and some, of you, some of you know what that's like because for a long time now, that's what you've been experiencing. You've been living in this recurring loop of regret and you would give anything, literally anything. You would pay any amount of money you could pay. You would give up anything you had to give up if you could somehow find a way out. Now, here's the question. If you can't delete those scenes, and if you can't go back and you know, edit them out of the story, what can you do? Well, you can do what we've been talking about for the last several weeks, and you can allow God to rewrite those scenes. See, one of the things that a film editor does, in addition to deciding which scenes should be included and which scenes, which scenes should be deleted, they also work with the director to decide which scenes need to be rewritten so that the story can be as compelling as possible. If you have your Bible open to Luke 19, what you find there is a story of a man, just like some of us, who had a lot of scenes that he desperately wanted to delete. But when he found he couldn't delete them, he decided to allow Jesus to rewrite them. His name is Zacchaeus. Now, you know the song, you know the story, and one of the problems is whenever we hear the story, we assume that because we heard this when we were kids and we sang a little song, that this must be a children's story. But it is not a children's story. The truth is that it's a story about a man who had a lot of deep regrets. As the story opens, Jesus and his disciples are traveling to Jerusalem for the Passover. The Passover was one of three Jewish festivals that every Jewish person was expected to celebrate inside the city of Jerusalem. So there are thousands of people all flocking towards Jerusalem. And on their way, they stopped by in this little town called Jericho, which was 18 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Jericho was a very important city because of its strategic location. It served as sort of the connecting point between all these major economic players. Now, keep that in mind as you read verse 1 and 2 of Luke 19. Here's what it says. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. Make sure you catch that last part. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about Matthew. Matthew was also a tax collector. And the way it worked in that time period, the Romans pretty much controlled the world. So they would take over an area. Then they would set up what were called these tax districts in all these different areas. And then they would auction off the rights to collect the taxes in each of those tax districts. It was called a tax franchise. And the reason people wanted the right to collect the taxes because the Romans had set up this deal where as long as they got what they wanted, they didn't care how much extra the tax collectors piled on top of it. So, for example, the Romans might come out and say, hey, everybody owes us 10% income tax. And the tax collector would come out and say, okay, everybody owes me 12% income tax. And as long as the Romans got their 10%, the, they didn't care what happened to the other 2%, which meant that the, the tax collector was free to keep that and do whatever he wanted. So these guys were getting rich. And the other thing they would do, whenever they set up one of these tax districts, is the tax collectors who bought the rights to collect the taxes would come in and they would hire these local people to serve as sort of the, the frontline tax agents. And that's what Matthew was. But Zacchaeus was different because Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. So one way to think about this is there's this huge pyramid scheme, right? And Matthew's somewhere in the middle, but guess who's at the top? It's Zacchaeus. He's got money literally flowing in from every direction. 
And so Luke tells us, this want you to know, this guy was loaded. This guy was extremely wealthy. But even with all his monetary success, Zacchaeus was a man who wrestled with a lot of regrets, career regrets, family regrets, relationship regrets. I mean, it was all part of his story. They were the moments he couldn't forget, the what ifs he couldn't answer, and the scenes that he could not edit out of his story, no matter how hard he tried. But then there came a day in which everything changed because he heard this rumor that this traveling rabbi, who by this point everybody knew about, was passing through his town. Check this out, verse 3, Luke 19. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, that culture, first century, there were two things that no adult person, especially somebody as wealthy and as powerful as Zacchaeus, would ever do. And in this story, Zacchaeus does both of them. It says that he runs ahead of the crowd, and he climbs up on a tree. Now, you say, why would he climb a tree? And and Luke kind of includes this line. He says, well, you know, Zacchaeus was short, which I kind of think is unnecessary to put that in the story, but that's just me. I mean, you may have a different feeling. But I don't think think the reason he climbed the tree is because he was short. I think it's because he was desperate. The only thing that would cause somebody like Zacchaeus to run ahead of a crowd And to climb up in a tree was not because he was short. It's because he had this this quiet desperation that comes when you find yourself living in the recurring loop of regret. Zacchaeus came to a point in his life where he was willing to do whatever it took just to have the opportunity to rewrite his story. Now, as you look at the passage, there are three parts to rewriting the story of your regrets that you see demonstrated here. Here's the first one. If you want to rewrite the story of your regrets, you first have to remember your regrets. Now, for some of you, you hear that and you think, that's nuts because I've spent my life trying to forget my regrets. But what we're talking about here is not what some of us do. We're not talking about dwelling on your regrets. We're not talking about, you know, reliving your regrets every night. We're not talking about performing some never-ending analysis of your regrets. What we're talking about here is going back, facing up to what you've done, trying to talk about what you've done and learning the lesson or maybe lessons that you can learn from it and then finding an emotionally healthy way to move forward. If you're not sure how to do that, you can start by answering what are called the five W's and an H that journalists sometimes use. We're going to put it on the screen. You start and you ask the question, what happened? That's the easy one because you already know that. And you just go down the list. When did it happen? How did it happen? Who was involved? Where did it happen? And why did it happen? As you start to answer those questions, you'll start to uncover some things that were previously covered, things that, lessons that, that you should have learned that maybe you haven't learned, and you can begin to, to move forward. Later today, in our connect groups, you're going to hear sort of the, the rest of the story from Kenny and Bethany Albertson, how they walk through both the struggle of addiction and the loss of a baby, and how through all of that, God continues to sustain them, continues to draw them closer to him and closer, closer to each other. And whatever you're doing, I know there's schedule conflicts and all this. Hey, whatever you're doing, whenever your group is meeting today, don't miss this one. If you've missed the others, don't miss this one because this is a clip that, that perfectly talks about, perfectly captures how God takes us at our worst and rewrites our stories into something beautiful if we allow him to do that. But what I hope you heard on the clip just before I started today is that none of that can happen until you get honest about where you are. I mean, you can't move forward until you look in the mirror and you face your situation about how messed up you've become. That's the prerequisite. And I think that's where Zacchaeus was as he climbed up in the tree that day. He'd reached a point in his journey in which he knew if his life was ever going to change, if it was ever going to look any different than it did at that moment, and if he was ever going to break out and change direction, it had to change that day. Now check out verse 5 in Luke 19. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, 
Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. One of the things I love about this story, here's Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus thinks that he's looking for Jesus. But what he discovered is that Jesus was looking for him. See, by this point in the story, everybody knew who Jesus was. But what's so cool about this is they arrive, Jesus arrives at this moment, and he looks up in the tree, and he already knows who Zacchaeus is. In fact, he knows everything about him. He knows everything he's done wrong, every wrong turn he's taken, every lie that he's told. He knows all of it. He knows the weight of all the regret that Zacchaeus is carrying. That's why it's so incredible when you get to verse 5 that Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Now, most of the time we think about a person's relationship with God, and we say, you know, that person invited Jesus into their heart. But this was the opposite of that. Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' life. He, was, he wanted to be a, such a part of his life that he just says, hey, you come down because I'm going, I'm going home with you. Of course, that makes the religious people crazy because Zacchaeus is one of those people that they wouldn't have anything to do with, but that doesn't seem to bother Jesus. Now, keep in mind that these nine verses in Luke 19 are kind of a summary, kind of a a snapshot of a much longer conversation, and we're not sure everything that was said, but we do know that by the time you get to verse 9, that Zacchaeus stands up and he says, I'm going to give I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've wronged anybody, which he'd wronged everybody, I'm going to pay back four times the amount. What's he doing there? He's doing the second thing. So first, you remember your regrets, and then secondly, you repair the damage at least as much as you can. See, what initially looks like a dramatic moment when you read the story is really just the the next step in the process. And so for Zacchaeus, repairing the damage looked like donating half his net worth to the poor and paying back everybody four times what he had taken from them. Now, in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament law, if you stole something from somebody, not only were you required to make restitution to pay back the amount you stole, you were also required to pay back an additional 20% as punishment to that person that you stole from. But Zacchaeus goes way beyond that. He says, I'm going to pay back everybody everything I took times four. I'm going to give them 400% of what I took for. And you say, how could he do that? He could do that because he was rich, extremely wealthy. Now, as you think back through your life, it might look different. As you think back over your deepest regrets, maybe there's something obvious that you need to do to try and repair some of the damage that you've done. Maybe there's a a debt you need to repay. Maybe there's a lie you need to go back and correct. Maybe there's a confession you need to make. Maybe there's a conversation you need to have. If the conversation is too awkward, just write a letter. I mean, don't send a text, but but write a letter and just, just see what happens. If you're not sure what you should do, but you know you need to do something, then you just pray and ask God to show you what your next step should be. The challenge, though, for some of you and for some of us is that as you look back over your life, maybe, maybe there's been some damage done that seems irreparable. Maybe the people involved are already dead or maybe something you did that for whatever reason, it just it can't be undone. And so the question becomes, what do you do to repair the damage when there's really nothing that you you can do. So I was, I was thinking about that question over this past week, and it occurred to me. I, I don't know, like, how long Zacchaeus was in the, the, the tax system, but I know, I mean, he, he made it the chief tax collector, so he'd been there a while. So here's what that means. That means there were literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of people that he had defrauded that were already dead. There was no way for him to go back and, and pay them back. So, so again, what do you do When there's nothing you can do, I I think you do what Zacchaeus did. You do the best you can, then you trust God, and you move on. 
See, there's a principle in Scripture that's really important that you need to understand. The, the Bible is clear. There is nothing you can do to pay for your own sins. I mean, if you could, if there were a way for you to do that, then Jesus would have never come, right? I mean, the reason he came to earth in the first place was to pay the debt that you can't pay and to do for you what you can never do for yourself. So the prophet Isaiah, Anita read it earlier, said it like this. He said, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So one way to read this would be to just change it up a little bit and say, come now, let us settle the matter. Though the damage you've done is like scarlet, it shall be white as snow. Though the things you regret are red as crimson, they shall eventually be like wool. But the key word that I want you to focus on is in that first line where it says, come now, let, let us settle the matter. It doesn't say, come now and you settle the matter. Because sometimes you can't. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. And so... You have to do your part as best you can. If there's nothing else you can do, you turn it over to God. And you allow him to settle the matter in a way that you may never see and in a way that you may not even be able to imagine. And that brings me to the third thing you have to do is you try to rewrite your story of your regrets. And it's this, you allow God to redeem your story. Go back to verse 5 in this passage. This is so powerful. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Your translation might say, received him joyfully. Now, most of the time, we read this part of the story. If you're like me, you spend your whole life and you think, okay, Jesus is going to go. They're going to have this quick visit because Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem. So they're going to go over to Zacchaeus' house. Maybe they're going to have, you know, a, a cup of coffee. Maybe if Jesus stays late into the day, they might share a meal together. But it's going to be sort of this, this quick visit, and then Jesus is going to move on down the road. But what's so cool about this is that the Greek word that Jesus used for stay in verse 5 is not the words you would use to describe a quick visit or a one-off meal. Instead, it's a word that literally means to remain or to abide or to dwell. In fact, it's the same words you would use if you were describing how you were going to move in with somebody permanently. See, what we think that Jesus is inviting himself over for a conversation, when in reality, he's inviting himself to move in with Zacchaeus. We think he's talking about a quick conversation. Instead, he's talking about a permanent partnership. And what's so cool about this, if you pay close attention to the narrative, then you'll notice that it's only after Zacchaeus welcomes Jesus into his home and into his life that he starts to change. Most of the time, we, we get it backwards. We think, I'm going to change and then I'm going to invite Jesus to be a part of my story. I'm going to invite Jesus to, into my home and into my heart and allow him to be a part of my life. But that's not the way it works. Instead, you invite him in first, and he starts to change you. That's a picture of redemption. It's a picture of Jesus taking someone who spent his life trapped in the recurring loop of regret and then rewriting his story in a way that Zacchaeus could have never imagined. That's why when you get to verse 9, it says, today salvation has come to this house. He woke up that morning and he was stuck in that recurring loop just like he had been every other morning. And what started as a story of regret quickly became a story of repentance and then ended as a story of redemption as Jesus did for Zacchaeus what Zacchaeus could never have done for himself. And it's interesting that even though everybody knows the story, after verse 9, Zacchaeus is never mentioned again in the Bible. But that's not the end of his story. There's one historical tradition that says not long after his encounter with Jesus and just a few days after the resurrection, which would happen a few days after this encounter, 
that Zacchaeus went to his bosses. He resigned his position as the chief tax collector. He walked away from his old life. He somehow got connected with the apostle Peter. He stayed close to Peter. And a few years later, little Zacchaeus, the, you know, the corrupt con man from Jericho, became the leader or the bishop of the church in Caesarea. I mean, if you were going to create a storyboard of Zacchaeus' life, it would be incredible from where he started to where he wound up. But that's what God does. He takes us at our worst, and then somehow he transforms us into the people that we were created to be. He did it for Zacchaeus. He's doing it for Kenny and Bethany. He's doing it for me and for a lot of other people in this room today. And the promise of the Bible is that no matter how messed up you are or how many chapters of your story you love to go back and, and edit out, he can do it for you. That's why I love verse 10 where it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save who? The lost. Not the found, the lost. Who did Jesus come for? He came for people, imperfect people with messed up stories. He came for people who have a lot of scenes in their past that they'd rather not relive and would give anything if they could somehow go back and edit it out. The only question is not, can God rewrite your story? We know that he can. And it's not, does God want to rewrite your story? We know what he, that he does. The only question is if we'll do what Zacchaeus did and welcome him gladly or receive him gladly joyfully. I want you to stand with me. As we close today, Jamie and his team are going to come, and they're going to lead us in, in two final songs. Uh, the first of those songs um, is titled Your Mercy, and we call this time the invitation, right? There's nothing magical about this. It, it's, it's literally an invitation to help you do what Zacchaeus did. If you've, never, if you've never welcomed him gladly, if you've never opened the door of your heart to Jesus, we love to walk you through that process. We had a young lady uh, baptized earlier this morning. We'd love to do that for you. So if you're here and you've never done it, you say, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Dave and I will walk you through the process. We will not do anything to embarrass you. We will not try to push you to do anything. We'll just answer your questions and help you as best we can. Or maybe you're here and you think, man, I need to pray with somebody because I'm not sure. You know, I've got all this stuff swirling around my head. I'm living on this recurring loop and I need a fresh start. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you. If you're here and you're ready to join the team here at First Christian, uh, we'd love to help you do that. So whatever you need to do, you just come meet us on this front row.